Genesis chapter four, verse one, Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very wroth, or very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you not, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Amen. Let's go back to verse number three. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil of, as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, some of the firstborn of his flock. What is this about that we want to get into? Why is uh, something like offering so, so uh, presented to us so early in the Bible? Just the fourth chapter of the Bible, and already God is speaking to us about offering. Which means to us, uh, we ought to listen. It's very important. I love the first few chapters of the Bible. Everything that you want to know and learn and love about the Word of God throughout the entire um, Bible, you can go back to the first few chapters of Genesis, and you can find the seed there. Genesis chapter 3 is my favorite chapter of the Bible. Anything that you want to talk about, any concept, any biblical principle, you can all trace it back to the first few chapters of the Bible. And so we're coming here to Genesis chapter 4. Cain worked the soil, and in the course of time, he brought some of the fruits of the soil. Some of it. If you're going to bring an offering to God, Amen. You want to bring the best of what you have because he only gives us the best. Amen. He didn't give me some of his love. He didn't give me just some mercy. He didn't give me some grace or some strength. Amen. He gave me the best of what he had, his abundant mercy and his abundant grace. Hallelujah. His abundant forgiveness. He forgave me more than I ever needed. Hallelujah. Amen. The debt of sin and the, and the guilt and the shame that I've carried, hallelujah, required a certain payment and a certain uh, purity, a certain shedding of blood to wash it away. And he went over and above and beyond all that and gave me more than I could ever ask for. Not only just took those things off of me and cleansed me, but he replaced sorrow with joy. And he replaced hopelessness with purpose. Amen. And an expected end. He's given us things. And he's, he's not only just washed away the dirt and the muck and the mire, but he's given us something clean. A clean robe, a crown to hold, a crown to look forward to, a name written down in a Lamb's book of life. He's He's given us more than we could ever ask for. And so if I'm going to show my love to God or return something to God, I can't just give him some of me. Some of me. Amen. You all get some of me, but my wife and my children get the best of me. Amen. My work gets some of me and I, I do the best I can there, but they don't get the best of me. They, they don't get the best of my time and my energy. I, you got to make up your mind. My family is going to get the best of me. Right. Amen. Not, not any other thing. The house of God, the things that you love is going to get the best of you. Right. Hallelujah. Not just some of you. Right. Not just some of you. I even stepped down. It was probably, what, two years ago now. I stepped down from my position uh, because I was taking my work home. I was thinking about work when I was at home. I was reading emails and answering questions off the clock and doing all kinds of different things. My, I, my, I'm physically at home at the park with my daughter, pushing her on the swing, but I'm working in my mind and working on the phone. I'm in the swimming pool with her, and I'm, and I'm working, and I'm thinking about numbers and dollars and and all these other things, and I got to the point where I, I was just giving my daughter, my family, some of me, but I was giving my work the best of me, and this thing had to flip, and so I made up my mind, no, it's, okay, I'll, I'm going to pay you guys all this money that I, I'm, retu I'm returning this to you so you can leave me alone. 
and I can give my family the best of me, and I can come and give my church the best of me, and my mind can be here. And so what we want to do is give God not just some of us. Cain brought some of his fruits. I got, he got carrots and cabbage and lettuce and, you know, whatever, cilantro, my favorite, and all, whatever, all these things that he brought, potatoes and tomatoes and pumpkins and watermelons. He brought some of it all to God without even, I would say, being with no discretion. He didn't take time and say, well, let me grab the best. Man, let me, how can I give God the best? And he's going through his bins and, and taking out 100 and giving, me, giving God the best percent or best 1% or 10% that he had. He just gave God some of it. Gave God some of it. And it, it fulfills a requirement, I guess, to bring an offering to God. He brought an offering to God of some of stuff. He got flocks, and he's got lambs, and he's got cattle, and he's all these. And he's, man, who, who ate the best this year? Who had the best diet? Who's got, who's got the most meat and fat? And who's, give me the juiciest cow I got, because I'm going to offer that one to the Lord. And he went through and went through all his flock and all his cattle, and he brings to God the best from some of the firstborn of his flock. Firstborn means uh, not necessarily like I'm the oldest, so I'm the firstborn. When you see the word firstborn in the Bible, it refers to the first in rank, the highest. So he brought to, to God the fattest, juiciest cattle and, and lamb and every, all, all of his flock. He brought the fattest and juiciest of the highest in rank. He brought the absolute best that he, brought, that he could bring to God. And he brings this offering to him. And God loves that offering. Says, yes, I approve of this. I'm all over it. Puts a stamp of approval down. Five stars. We'll eat here again. I love it. He loved that offering. And Brother Robert set me up because he's over here telling great stories about his wife. And I'm about to tell this story about my wife. <laughs> Sometimes before bed, she wants a bowl of ice cream. And she'll ask me for a bowl of ice cream, and I'll go get her some ice cream. Fill up that bowl, chocolate, waffle, caramel, truffle things. Fill up that bowl, and I'll bring her the bowl of ice cream. And I'm on my iPad reading or listening to something. She's working on her laptop. Maybe like 18 seconds later, that entire bowl's gone. Not 18 seconds. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that entire bowl's gone. And I'm sitting there like looking at her with my mouth open, jaw dropped, like, I'm like two feet away, and we've been married almost nine years. How do you forget me? You just like forget I exist every time I just bring you a bowl of ice cream. Like, not, didn't even offer me, you didn't save me one bite. Not one little taste of this ice cream. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to save you some. I meant to save you some. But it's all gone now. And with ourselves, we might intend in our mind, God, I'm, I'm going to give you, God, I'm going to, I have my offering, I, I made my money, I made my tithes, I got my time, I thank you for the blessing and everything that you've given me, and we make up in our mind, we tell ourselves, God, I'm, I'm going to give you this, and then we get involved in all this, I got to spend money over here, I get involved in this, I got to spend time over here, I got to get in with this, with this, with this, and then when it's all over, the end of the week, the end of the month, God's looking at us like waiting for his bite of ice cream, and it's gone. We've used it all. We spent it all. And we haven't given God the best of ourselves, even though he's done everything to give of himself the best to us. He's given us the absolute best. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's given us everything. He's given us a church. He's given us, God, he gave gifts unto men. Hallelujah. He's given us everything. The baptism of the spirit, the promise. He's given us something to look forward to. He's given us a promise of a home with him forever, to be with him for all eternity. And so Cain's in this situation where he gave God just some. And the Lord said, why are you angry? I'm the one that, why? <laughs> he didn't accept this offering. Why are you angry? You gave me this and you're upset with me about it. Why are, you ang why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? I'm not just rejecting you or not blessing you or not giving you favor and all of these things because I don't like you or I'm partial to your brother, but you're bringing me nothing. 
You know, you don't even appreciate the time that I spent with you and all the things that I've given you. I've given you all this land. All of this is yours. I've given you all these fruits and all these vegetables and everything that you have. Every you have, I've given you every opportunity to prosper and you give me absolutely nothing and you're thankless and now you're upset with me about it. If you, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, hiding behind a bush, waiting for you to walk out, and it's going to jump all over you. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. When I first came uh, to live for God, it was 2005. I was 21, 21 years old, um, and, I re- and I got my tax rebate back and it was a thousand dollars and i remember i said okay if i'm gonna i'm gonna live for god so this is april may i received the holy ghost uh april 24th i was baptized in jesus name may 1st and so tax came tax time came around then then i said okay or before then so i said okay if i'm gonna live for god if i'm gonna do this i'm not gonna let anything separate me from from God. And, and I know one of the main things that separate people from living for God is just this, this money issue, this thing. You can't, I was like, I'm not going to go out like that. So I brought that whole 1000 I said, here, God, this is between me and you. I don't have anything. I, I, I was getting back and forth to church on a credit card to pay for my gas because I didn't have any gas money. I don't recommend that, but that's what I did just to get to the house of the Lord. I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money, but I had this $1,000. I said, okay, I'm going to give this to you. This is between me and you that this will never separate us. Money will never be an object between you and I. And so establish it at the beginning that I'm going to rule over it. Hallelujah. Whatever it is, that thing that you can potentially see between you and God, that could eventually be something that that could grow into something. That little fox could be something later on. You got to make up your mind. I somehow have to rule over it. Whatever it is, I got to make up my mind to rule over it. I got to tackle that thing. I got to kick that little fox. Tie them together. Set them on fire. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse six. Paul's writing. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need, and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, he was he was writing to uh, the Corinthian church um, to bring an offering or send an offering to Jerusalem. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news or the gospel of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. We had recently given an offering that um, helped pay for air conditioning in the church in Lisbon, Portugal. And so they got that brand new air conditioner. And now they can have church and not be all sweaty and hot and muggy and keep all the doors open. Everybody with fans, they got an air conditioner. They can let loose and have revival. And they're thankful for that. And they're praising God, I'm sure, when they announce it. Hey, we got this, your new air conditioner. People start running the aisles, doing backflips, biting sheetrock out of the walls. (laughs) And they're excited. And they're thanking God for his provision. And, every, and God providing and making a way where there seems to be no way and where they lacked and what they were missing, 
Amen. The body of Christ from the other side of the world was able to provide and and send that gift. And God was able to use that and multiply it and bless that church is his, this other portion of his body, this other side of his body. And so what Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, he says, because you did this, Jerusalem has need. And now they're worshiping God and praising God. And they see God in a greater way than they had before. They know God as a supplier of all their need. They know God as the source of all their supply. They know God as the one who can supply them according to his abundant riches and glory. And now they know and they praise God for this because of of Corinthians giving an offering, these people over here have a greater relationship and an understanding of God. And so when Paul's writing, he says, thank God for this unspeakable gift. He's talking about how God can use a gift and use an offering and use the generosity to bless you, uh, to multiply his blessing in your life and to continue to flow through you as long as you don't stop it up. God can continue to flow through you and create a generous new heart in you that you'll always be blessed and you'll always be a blessing. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. He says, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. Would a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you ask, what do you mean? Wherein did we ever cheat or rob you? God replies, you have cheated me of tithes and offerings due to me. And so you are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. And here's the solution. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease or I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Paul said, uh, don't give out of pressure or reluctantly or out of a response to pressure. And so sometimes we use that scriptures to pressure people into giving. Give, 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 give. You got to give or else you're going to be under the curse. Hey Amen. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, cheerful giver, not a fearful giver. Amen. I, we, we don't give out of fear. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm trying to enlighten you to the blessings that God has for you. I, we, do, we don't give out of fear. I, I, we don't. We don't give out of fear. We withhold out of fear. I don't know what's happening in the next year. I don't know what's going to happen with my job. I don't know what's going to happen with my housing market. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know what I'm going to eat. So we withhold out of fear. But God said to give with cheer. We don't give out of fear. We withhold. And that's not what God desires from us. Amen. To be a cheerful giver. Amen. To, to, to respond to him. To love him. To give cheerfully. He says, uh, as a man, whatever man purposes in his heart, that's up to you. Ties belong to God. He says, this is mine. This is the first tenth of everything. The tithe belongs to me. It's all mine. That's mine already. So I make, so I make $100. That first 10 bucks, that's God's. That's his. It's not a gift I'm giving to God. That tithe is not a gift. It's not giving him his own stuff. It's like you borrow my car and bring it back. I'm like, oh, thank you. This is amazing. It's mine already. This is a blessing. It's already mine. You bring a tithe to God, he's not, he's, whoa, blessing right here. Thank you. That's already his. That's his. So we give our tithe. We're back at zero. I, give, I got $100. I give God his first 10. We're at zero. We're even. So what is offering? An offering is anything above that 10%. 
If I made $100, I give God 10%. That's $10. If I give him one penny, that's an offering. But it's about how much my love for God is, my thankfulness to him. I met the requirement. I gave him that one penny. God, you got an offering. I met the requirement of tithes and offering. But what does that say about my love for God? What does that speak to him? An offering is anything above that 10%. Anything. It could be a nickel. It could be a quarter. I love you, God. (laughs) Anything above that 10%, that's an offering. Technically. You're technically correct. You brought some of it. It wasn't high quality. It was an offering, I guess. He technically met the requirement. But Abel brought, man, the juiciest. God, I love you so much. He brought him the fattest, juiciest of the first fruits, of the best that he absolutely had. He took 100, narrowed it down to the top 10. Took the top 10, oh, narrowed it down to the absolute best. God, I'm giving you this because you've been so good. God, you've forgiven me of so much. You opened so many doors that I thought were shut that I could never walk through. You brought me out of places I could never bring myself out of. You brought me out of dark places in my mind and in my spirit. You've healed my body, Lord Jesus, in ways that doctors never could. Hallelujah. You made provision, oh Lord. Your mercy has kept things, kept... You, you, you kept back flooding waters that should have wiped me away, but your mercy held it off. You've given me grace, O oh Lord. You've given me everything that my heart could ever imagine and so much more. And so, Lord, here's my offering. I want God, when I bring an offering, I want God to understand, Lord, I appreciate you. I really do understand that I cannot do this on my own. I cannot do this by myself. I want you to understand how much I love you, and I'm going to place you first. I'm not just going to give you some of myself, but I'm going to give you the best of myself, the best that I have. And I'm not going to give out of a fearful heart, but out of a cheerful heart. Lord, I'm excited to give this to you. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commandments or trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich, and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. It said before God is a book of remembrance. Hold on, write this down. That when it all went bad, when everything started crashing, when dollars started burning up, dollars became nothing, turned to dust, or grew wings and flew away. Remember these ones, hallelujah, never spoke against me. Remember these ones remained faithful to me. Remember that these ones, amen, committed themselves to my way and to my word, and, and, and they loved me, and they loved the righteousness of God more than all these things. Remember it was them. That book of remembrance, your name gets written down. It's where I want to be. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. It's so much more important even, even now that I'm gone. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God, I, I don't want to just give you the absolute minimum. Here's my tithes. Here's my nickel. I met the quota. I fulfilled the requirement. But work out, take responsibility for your salvation. Be careful with it. Amen. God, I want to give you something more. Take responsibility for the things that you do when you live for God. Work out your own salvation. Because 
it's God which works in you both to will or to want to and to actually perform or act on that desire to do his good pleasure. Luke 12, 27, look at the lilies, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. So why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink and don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything that you need. Thank God for his promises. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. My daughter thinks everything in my house is hers. It belonged to me long before she got here. She said, Dad, can you get my ladder? I'm like, ladder? You don't have a ladder. Yeah, I remember the other day you were cleaning the garage and there was a blue ladder in there. Can you get my ladder? You don't have a ladder. It's my ladder. My car, my house. This is my fridge. But if you see my fridge, stickers everywhere, top to bottom, scotch tape taping the both doors in the fridge, the freezer to the fridge, and both doors together, scotch tape everywhere. This is my art project. <laughs> Everything in the house is hers. But it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. God wants, you, wants to, you to see him the, way, the same way that your three-year-old daughter, two-year-old daughter, your child would see you. Yeah. And if we don't have it in the house, Dad, can we just go buy one? Who's we? We going to halves on this? Can we just go buy one? But she thinks I got power to do it all. And that's how God wants you to see him. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Anything that you need in your life. God, you got mercy and that's what I need. You got grace, and that's what I need. Yes. I got this disease in my body, but that healing. Yeah. Right. Amen. God, can I get my healing real quick? God, I, I'm, I'm in debt. I don't know how to. I, I don't see a way out. God, can I, can I get my provision real quick? Can I get my inheritance real quick? The same way she thinks I can provide everything, he actually can. God, I need. You might not have it right now. I don't have it at the house. Dad, can we just go buy it? Might not have it right now, but Lord, I know you can get it. You own the cattle on a thousand years. I know you can do it. I know you can make a way where there seems to be no way. God, I need a miracle. I don't have it right now. Can you go buy it? By his stripes, we are healed. He was bruised for our transgressions. For our iniquity. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. God, can you go buy that healing I need? Yeah, let me go to Calvary real quick. It's already been purchased. Your healing that you need, he's already purchased it. The provision you need, he's already purchased. The grace, the mercy, God, I need your touch. It's already been purchased. The Holy Ghost that you need inside of your spirit to set that fire, he's already paid the price that allows you to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. God, I love you, Jesus. Revelations 21, 6. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 
Aleluia.